general's daughter in a vast empire that revels in war and enslaves those it conquers, 17-year-old Kestrel has two choices. She can join the military or get married. But Kestrel has other intentions. This is the podcast that gets lit, a boozy book club, episode three. Let's get lit. Welcome, everybody, to the podcast that gets lit. Woo! We are getting lit in here. <laughs> uh, not really. Maybe just, just a little. <laughs> Maybe just getting started. Uh, so tonight, we are going to be talking about The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkowski. Uh, I am Bailey. And I am Luke. So, The Winner's Curse was published on March 4th, 2014. It is 355 pages, or approximately 8 hours and 24 minutes of listening time. And the Goodreads synopsis, Winning what you want may cost you everything you love. As a journalist's daughter in a vast empire that revels in war and enslaves those it conquers, 17-year-old Kestrel has two choices. She can join the military or get married. But Kestrel has other intentions. One day, she's startled to find a kindred spirit and a young slave up for auction. Aaron's eyes seem to defy everything and everyone. Following her instinct, Kestrel buys him with unexpected consequences. It's not long before she has to hide her growing love for Aaron. But he, too, has a secret. Kestrel quickly learns that the price she paid for a fellow human is much higher than she could have ever imagined. Set in a richly imagined new world, The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkowski is a story of deadly games where everything is at stake and the gamble is whether you will keep your head or lose your heart. Dun dun dun! (laughs) It sounds so serious. It does, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Does it sound as serious as the book actually is, looking back? It sounds way more serious than the book is it i think yeah i i think i'd agree with that it's almost like they want you to i don't know think the consequences are much higher than they are when it doesn't feel that way when you're reading it yeah i i think we'll probably i I definitely have some criticisms there's a lot of good things I, i mean i think this that's what we're here for right say what we like say what didn't sit well with us, so we'll we'll definitely get into those. Uh, my question, for, so this is this is your second book pick, right? What's your yes. actual personal history with reading this book? I oh god, I've probably read this book like ten times over. I adore this book and the series. Um, I've always been really attracted to the characters and just the way that they're written. So I thought that it was going to be a a good, interesting book to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. did you read this pretty much right away when it first came out in 2014 no so it was published in 2014 i didn't read it until like january of 2017 okay i think it was the very first book i read for my goodreads challenge in 2017 gotcha gotcha yeah no i have this is my first experience reading this book i haven't read it before i've read it three times in preparing for this because (laughs) it's what i do i after being a first-time reader for so long, it it just bothers me being ignorant. I, I might look good at it, but I don't like it. Well, you know, it's like even as many times as I've read this, I still didn't feel quite ready. Because we were, we were planning on doing this last last Monday? Last Monday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was like, okay, let's, let's push it a little bit. I want to get one more reread in there. So mm-hmm. I can never be too prepared. The thing that's I, I kind of enjoyed about this boozy book club that we're doing, this monthly book club, is they're books that I picked six books and you picked six books, but not all of them are we super deep experts in, right? It's like a, hey, I read this book last year and I think you would like it. Or it's kind of a trade back. Or, you know, like the first book we did was something that you have been reading over and over you know it really really well and so there it just ebbs and flows i think that's a pretty cool Mm -hmm. thing that we've got going of 
different and like Mistborn, I've read it a couple times and I really, really dig it. But I, I mean, I, I am no, I am not an expert on it at all. So I mean, by the time the show is over, you will be. I know, right? I know that's the goal. <laughs> I will also probably yeah, be drunk. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of that, you mentioned this is our boozy book club. So what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking a lovely Irish red that was brewed on Leap Day this year. So this is my Leaping Shillelagh is what it's going to be called from now on. And uh, yeah, it's a home, home brewed. And um, on, on deck, I've got the same thing that was then aged a little bit with um, some vanilla bean as well. So, well, hmm. two, two beers of the similar style. That sounds delicious. How about you? I am drinking what Luke likes to call an 802. Oh, classic 802 is uh, right there. This uh, it dates back to the first time Luke ever came out to California to visit. And we were at Red Robin. He had heard me talk about this beer quite a bit because it's something I drink fre- frequently. It's readily available at Costco in bulk. It tastes good. Uh, so he goes to order the beer and he says, uh, can, I, can I have an 802? the bartender looks like what are you talking about (laughs) just started laughing so hey since then it has always been referred to as an 802 (laughs) that's by firestone walker is that right yes it is an 805 by firestone walker it's also an 802 by firestone walker let's be honest (laughs) at this point five it turns into a two yeah right (laughs) it's not that far off yeah it's close it's close Okay, so let's dive into The Winner's Curse. What are your first thoughts? So I I will say pretty quickly on my first time through this book, I got some serious flashbacks to the show Carnival Row that came out last year. There were many times where, I don't know if it was just the almost sense of noir or or what like just the feeling of the environment made me think of that similar thematic visual style i think and also with that our two main characters kestrel and Aaron. spoilers they end up falling in love slowly and frustratingly and just get to the fucking point lee but it very much felt like two of the big characters in in Carnival Row that end up falling in love at the very, very end. And there's some similar themes, I think, um, between that. So it's, you know, it's the characters, um, oh shoot, it's uh, Agraeus and, oh, what was her name? I I had these all down and now I can't, I was ready last Monday. (laughs) See, it's all my fault. And, wow, what's her name? Um, Spurn Rose, the girl. Uh, uh, Imogen. Tara Delevingne and uh... no, it, it's uh, Imogen and uh, Agraeus, the the puck, the fawn, the guy with the horns. When they so, it's a bit of like the class to class. Um, one group is almost all slaves, and they end up kind of breaking that tie. But I just got some feelings of that and. Definitely some um, Spartacus feels as the major theme, I'd say, of big rebellion, the slave rebellion, um, and some politics going on. So I'd say those were the two is the two biggest comparisons I could think of. Hmm, that's interesting. I've really only seen like two episodes of Carnival Row, so I... Ah, I'll have to go and go spoiled. Watch that. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. Spoilers are good sometimes. Sometimes. Um, but you know, clearly, if I've only seen two episodes, I'm not extremely into it, so I'm not worried about a, a spoiler here. Okay. In this instance. Okay. You're off the hook. I'm off the hook. <laughs> Thank God. <sighs> okay. Um. See, the first thing that I really noticed about this book is that Kestrel, she's not like most young adult heroines. She's not 
a fighter or a hunter, she her weapon is her her wit and her her mind. She is calculating, and I think that she has a, a great mind for war, in the sense that she would be a great like general or a, someone who's behind the scenes leading the way, um, which is kind of what her father hopes that she's going to go into the army um, instead of her other choice, which is to get married. And I think that she tries to work that in a way that works for her and what she wants to do. Cause she doesn't want to do either of those things. Right. And she gets to a point where her father, the, this famous general who was almost single-handedly responsible for subjugating this area and these people, um, she he basically gives her an ultimatum to either marry it comes spring and this is kind of fall ish time so she should have several months or join the military and kind of follow in his footsteps and it's kind of it seems like one of those once you join the military you're pretty much never gonna marry at least in like the wealthy ways like for prestige is what it seems like um so it's really like a hey, this is a choice that is going to be with you forever, is the way it's portrayed. Which, when you think about it, is almost silly, because they talk about how the population in this this country is extremely low, and that there's, you know, you don't engage in silly things that might cause you to die. You know, you don't do duels, and you don't do basically anything that could harm your life. Like, that's an extremely punishable offense. So you think they'd want you to go into the military and get married. That it's never made sense to me. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. And I mean, Kestrel's father was, I'm assuming, married to her mother before she died. Yeah, I don't know if it was ever stated specifically that way. But it's definitely like assumed that they were clearly in love, and I guess by association you can infer that they were. But it's definitely never clearly stated that I can remember. I guess maybe it's not, but the implication I think is there that they, if not were in love, they were at least in some sort of a familial unit. Yeah, I. Yeah, I, I, my point is I, I didn't even consider it them not being a family together, mm -hmm. the three of them at least. It just wasn't really a thought until just now. Yeah. So uh, I see in your notes here you have some commentary on Kestrel's thoughts of relationships. Oh, yeah. No, this one I thought uh, as it was – as we were listening through, I was like, man – Hmm, that's interesting. Especially who I'm going to be talking about with this book with. Uh, so there's a line in here where there's a part in the book where um, Aaron, the slave that was bought by Kestrel, they, they start getting to know each other a little bit, and she doesn't really like slavery in general. Is that seems to be a pretty much pretty mainstay thing from the get go. So she buys this slave almost unsure of why she's doing it, but it, she also accidentally <laughs> she also kind of does it in a way that she like doesn't give any orders for him. So he's just like around the house for a while, like the mansion for a while, and then like the slave keeper, I guess, is like, well, she hasn't told me what she wants me to do with him, so I'm just gonna put him to work in the blacksmiths and he does a really good job and becomes pretty decent like decently respected at least in terms of slavery um but there gets to be a point where this whole time we find out he's acting as an informant for this slave rebellion that's been building within the town that kestrel has no idea about and that's really why he's a slave in the household of the general unbeknownst to kestrel but he convinces her to give him basically rights enough to go to town to see his sweetheart, uh, who is really just the, inf the other people in the rebellion. He's just lying to her, but 
it, it's there's a point where he's like, you know, I, I really wish I could go back down to town again. And she she thinks to herself, it hasn't been that long. And he's like, it's been a month. And she thinks to herself, wow, it must be really difficult. You know, it must feel like a really long time between see, seeing your sweetheart, you know, a whole month. Wow. And um, it's just funny because Bailey and I have been in a distance relationship for coming up on two years now. And a month would be like awesome if that was all it was. Like I would trade that. That would be ideal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about ideal. It would be an improvement. I mean, for a distant relationship, yeah. it's better than yes. If it's gonna, if it had to remain a all distance thing, better. yes. Okay, fair. <laughs> no, permanently. I just want it to be a month in between, no matter no. what. Thanks, baby. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> So I just thought that was a... Uh... Yeah, no, so clearly clearly, Kestrel's never had anyone that she's felt this way about to even ha have an idea of fathoming, you know, not seeing someone that you care strongly about for a month. She just is like, oh, well, yeah, I guess that might be a long time. I guess that's <laughs> tough. <laughs> so I just thought that was... Uh... That was funny, spe specifically for this conversation. It, it made me chuckle seeing it in your notes. My comment here is, tell me about it uh, in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So we see Kestrel and R, and they, they're constantly playing this game called Bite and Sting, which is, I don't know, I think of it kind of like as Mahjong, sort of. It, it's these tiles and... I'm not sure exactly on the logistics of the game, but th there's icon or tiles with icons on them, and you lay them down in a way that somehow makes you more powerful than the other person or mm -hmm. persons you're playing against. Um, and Kestrel and Arn, they constantly play this over and over. And at first, they they start. It's kind of the way that they learn about each other. They, you know, whoever loses has to answer a question. Um, and so I think that the way they bond over this game almost mimics the way that in their real lives they're going to have to play these games in order to come out on top. That you know, Aaron is he he's playing the rebellion almost. He starts out being really into it and he's dedicated to the rebellion, but as he sees the leader of the rebellion and what he does, he feels less and less maybe like he agrees with it or thinks that they're going about it in the wrong way. Um, and Kestrel is the same way, sort of playing the rules of her society in order to get the outcome she wants. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of strategy in this in this game, right? And I, I think we're supposed to see that they both bring a different skill set to it. And I, I think it's... She she play so it's a game that apparently you could play with up to four people I think unless that think was so. a different card game that they were playing but I think it was the same. No, I'm thing. pretty sure it was still Bite and Sting. So, it's a game that you can play with at least with up to four people, but you can't play with three. It's either two or four is what it sounded like because there was one point they're like, well, we can't play with three, so I guess you kind of team up in a way. Um, so, yeah, it, it definitely seems to be something that's used narratively as a way for them to get to know each other and even strategically get to know their strength each other's strengths which for good or worse they get to know each other pretty in depth because of it and they end up playing for bets right i mean what what were they betting you tell me well they were betting secrets right they they were basically say you know asking questions you know and yeah so I guess you could say they were betting parts of themselves, really. I mean, yeah. they're you know, things that people might not know that they might not have otherwise felt comfortable sharing with each other. Yeah. And I mean, pretty obviously early on, they kind of start falling for each other um, because of this proximity and, this game and the getting to know each other. And I mean, like we've said, it doesn't seem like Kestrel's really ever had any serious romantic relationships like at all. She's been forced to think about it in a political kind of way. 
but it doesn't seem like she's ever had to let her emotions be involved because she to me she seems fairly naive in certain things because of that and that's just the 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 initial take i i have on her and not that she's not intelligent she's just a little naive in that realm yeah it's almost like she has refused to think about marriage and she's refused to think about romance and even she's refused to think about joining the military because these are her only options and she doesn't like them so she's just going to ignore it yep the do nothing option <laughs> let's just keep going to parties and play and bite and sting do you know it works until the uh, the deadline comes what is it before your 18th birthday you've got to decide if you're going to be married or i think it was 20 it was 20 because he okay. was her, her father was forcing her to choose early she was like i have right. basically two more years and he's like nope not that's in this household weird. because she's 18 that where i was thrown yeah she was about to be 18 she was 17 to start the book and i think that spring she would be turning 18 and would have to choose yeah but that was still he was forcing it to be an early decision because it's his way or she chooses the other way well and i mean it kind of makes sense from her father's perspective you know he's the general of this army and for his daughter to have not chosen to join the army basically is what he's he's thinking is that you know there must be something wrong with her i've not done a good job raising her what are people going to think of me so i can i can understand where her father's coming from and wanting her to make this decision before she's legally required to yeah i mean i don't think it's uncommon maybe unreasonable for parents to really want you know, their children to follow in their footsteps, right? Especially if they've done something themselves that's great or, you know, publicly revered, like, and they see the benefits of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's what they know, right? It's like, hey, I would love it if my son grew up to be an engineer, but I also realize I'm not going to worry about that. But I can see how people think that way, you know, like, hey, this is my skill set. If this person that I raised goes into it too, it's just something more that we can connect with on an even more personal level than we could otherwise. Um, so I think there's a, that's kind of the thought process with it to an extent. I almost think about it less as like a specific skill set and almost more like the family business. Sure. You know, I, I've done this thing and I've created it for you and you should follow in my footsteps and take up this helm that I've created for you because I've made it great so why don't you want it right and I've literally and I've been doing my best what he thinks <laughs> yeah and I've literally been doing my best to in, in essence groom you to be the one that I pass this torch to most effectively right and I, I think there are benefits to that of hey you like a, like a major league baseball player whose son ends up playing in the game. It's kind of like, guess what? You grew up around the game the way it's supposed to be played, around players. You know, it's it's just not that uncommon. And guess what? There's a certain uh, physicality of it that you grow up and you have the biology that might benefit you as well. So if you put both of those things together, the experience from being a kid around the game it's only going to give you a better shot to make it to the majors, right? It's it's just going to help you. Yeah, which from like a child standpoint, I feel like it works out 50-50. Like either you absolutely love this thing that you've grown up with your whole life or you despise it because that is the only thing you've known and you just want something new. Yeah, yeah. So. It's not for everyone is yeah. kind of what it comes into. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You might like it, or you might not. <laughs> it's, well, it's a bit of a binary. Let's flip thing. a coin. <laughs> Let's flip a coin, like a target. <laughs> uh, okay, so I see you've got a, a a glass of wine is like holding a jewel. What is what is your your thought on this? <laughs> so do you remember that line, right? Where yes, um, basically there's this big uh, kind of ball or dance party thing that's being thrown by this royal douche um but aren't we all, aren't we all? 
<laughs> but um, so our main character Kestrel shows up at this party with uh, her friend. Well, before her friend Jess gets there, and she has to dance with this other kind of high class douche who's <laughs> just kind of a nobody <laughs> douche canoe and um basically her friends jess and her brother ronan finally show up and kind of save her because she's been really outcasted by this society because of the question of her relationship with Aaron. it seems like they've been spending a lot of time together she's used him as her escort to protect her uh, she also fought a duel for him, uh, which I think we'll probably come back to and talk about that. Um, but her friends basically save her from being outcasted in this party that she didn't even want to go to, that they forced her to go to. And her friend Jess is basically saying, you know, I, I forget exactly what she's saying, but she's, she's talking about their clothes, right? Their dresses and the jewels and jewelry and everything that that they're not wearing they're they're kind mm -hmm. of not accenting with necklaces and jewelry like they usually do and kestrel is kind of like why like why why is it different tonight and i don't know there was just an interesting line of basically the the lady of the house that's throwing the party has this special wine this uh iced apple wine that she's been raving about having several barrels brought in just for this party. And Jess made the decision, well, we're not going to wear a lot of jewelry because isn't holding a glass of wine kind of like holding a large jewel. And I don't know. I just kind of, I liked that of, you know, there's something nice about having a glass and letting that, you know, be almost an accessory. And I, I don't know. It, there's so many different colors and as a home brewer and someone who, appreciates all of that stuff i i just thought it was a neat line to work in here where i mean you could easily have just skipped over that and not have that be a thing at all but it just caught my attention i don't know yeah no i i definitely agree and especially you know not that people do this but like matching your drinks to your outfit i'm sure someone does it somewhere like Every throwing a party day of and... my life <laughs> You know, I could see some socialite throwing a party and specifically being like, well, I'm going to wear red, so I'm going to have this really deep red wine. Like, right. I, I could see that happening somewhere. And, you know, depending on what you're drinking and if there's options and people judge what you're drinking when you're at a party, you know, oh, well, you're drinking seltzer water. I'm drinking sparkling water. <laughs> and both are bad Ugh, not a fan <laughs> not a fan Ugh, water <laughs> Ugh. dry air bubbles in water get out of here gross no just water just take I'll, I love water <laughs> no for, for will, reference I, I do you. not drink water like ever you. Luke is constantly telling me to drink more water <laughs> Yeah, but I just like that that line, and then obviously that becomes a poison that kills a lot of people. So it's it's a bit of a, you know, hey, here's a thing, focus on it, and then it turns into the thing that kills people. But I don't know, just the way it was presented, I I kind of liked it. Poisonous jewels. That sounds a lot like a TV show we've watched. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Can't think of what that could possibly be, but one of your notes down here brings a parallel to it. Oh, that's funny. You're right. So, um, <laughs> you want to let's let's chat about the duel real quick. The thing that yeah, I didn't really have any notes on it, but um, they go to earlier in the story from that um dance that we were talking about. They were at another dance, and. Yeah. She, there's a lot of dances there's a couple dances a lot of dresses and um basically kestrel brings Aaron with her then and this is really where the chatter starts and Aaron, for or some at least reason, where kestrel first learns about it i think yes like there's been s some whisper yes in just a minute and go for it so so I'll, kestrel I'll she 
she basically steps in when Aaron he's found lurking in a library where he's not supposed to be and it turns out that this is Aaron's former house before the Harani were overthrown before the Valorians have come in and now taken all of these Harani homes and made them their own and so we find out that this party is being thrown at Aaron's former house um he is lurking in the library and he's found holding a copy of this book that he's said to have stolen um so Kestrel says well no of course he's not stolen it he is just you know he's he's curious he's looking he's got nothing better to do than you know be here at this party and be my my escort if you will um so he Kestrel starts to flip through the book and finds that it was dedicated to Arryn, and this is how she finds out it's Arryn's former household. Um, so in order to defend her slave, she proposes a duel with the owner of the house. Who is the douche guy? Yes, well, one of a few douche guys. I'd there's, say he's the there's bigger. A couple. There's a couple. Of, yes. of the nice guy socialites, he's the biggest douche of that age group yeah so Kestrel she proposes this duel and he says oh no I couldn't I couldn't possibly duel you you know I'll let you take it back um Kestrel basically says no that that's not the way of our culture once you propose a duel it's set in stone so I'm not taking it back you you will fight me and you just pick a time so he picks a time, Kestrel picks the the method of the duel, which turns out to be something called needles, which I believe you, you basically have like seven small knives on you. Mm-hmm. It sounded like throwing daggers, basically. Yeah. So do you want to get into your, your, your thoughts on this duel? Yeah, I, just in general, I thought it was interesting that she, at this point, already seems to be unbeknownst to herself protecting Aaron right in the way that she can and it's just one of those it takes her a long time to realize that she's falling for this guy everyone yeah, else even at is the seeing point it. she proposes this duel she just thinks that she's helping a friend which no one sees their slave as a friend <laughs> right and everyone else is looking at this like okay this this is uh this is a thing <laughs> yeah like you don't just uh become friends with your slave in this society it's just not a thing okay <laughs> like uh... yeah and even later on a little bit um someone mentions to kestrel you know people turn the other way when you when you have romantic relations with your your slave there's a reason that no one questions when you spend too long in a carriage with your slave or that no one questions you know, why you have scurried away to go do something with them. But, you know, no one talks about it and you're just being so brazen about this, Castrol. <laughs> and she's she's so oblivious to it. Right. And I think he realizes a bit what's going on. I don't think he overly tries to manipulate her into it I, I guess i think you could make a read looking at it that way but i don't get anything but pretty genuine good person from him typically mm -hmm. um but i think you can make a case that he's manipulating her to create this scenario to make the rebellion even easier but i i, I just don't see it in him personally um he's a pretty good guy and it's i mean he was a really well-to-do person in the society that was enslaved right and that's something that she's mm -hmm. surprised to find out over time of like wow he can speak our language with no accent he's like clearly really well educated he kicks my ass in this game that i'm really good and at he gives himself away so easily sometimes you know, as a slave he's not supposed to know a lot of these things and he 
eavesdrops on Valorian conversation and then has commentary about it. And Kestrel's like, oh, crap, well, he understood that? Like, clearly he's not just some lowborn Harani. Yeah. So. He's not good at playing dumb, is I think. No, part he's of the not. But Which I think is why it makes it so believable that he's not trying to set Kestrel up in this way. Yeah. I and think even so. like with the um the rebellion that we get to where they, they poison the wine, they've basically taken out all of the upper level Valorians, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um you know, Aaron tells Kestrel, don't drink the wine tonight. No matter what you do, do not drink the wine. And she's like okay that's weird but i guess whatever um so he he's always looking out for her even if he's not being clear about it to her so we got a a question just following up why is this guy a slave and i know you kind of described it but just to reiterate this this guy's entire people was subjugated by basically uh the empire right who general trajan who's kestrel's father is almost entirely responsible for this expansion into this territory and so yeah you have everyone all all walks of life within that people i don't know you know that society that have been subjugated and put underfoot by the valorians and that's kind of where this is coming this is probably like 10 years before this i think somewhere around there it feels recent like enough for people to have started to forget maybe what the harani culture was like they what things were like before they were taken over basically right and it, it, it almost become has to, the normal it has to have been within the past 10 or 12 years because um after this subjugation happened there was a a plague kind of thing a sickness that mm-hmm. went around and only the haranis knew how to uh combat that and kestrel had it and had markings of being saved by harani healing and mm-hmm. that's one thing Aaron notices and he's like hey what's that all about like clearly that happened after and it's a whole thing of her father basically forced this guy to either die himself or save his daughter from this sickness. And so she was probably seven or so. So that, that would put it about 10 years, maybe 12 years ago that this all went down. Yeah. Which makes sense given Aaron's knowledge of other cultures and languages and his upbringing. He, he had to have some time to learn it Mm -hmm. because he's, similar in age to kestrel so this this rebellion happens and in my opinion it was maybe a little too easy it was just kind of like hey they planted some information that got the general and like everyone that has anything to do with protecting the city aside from like the city watch like the redcoats basically protecting the city and then they go and poison this one party and guess what? They've that like taken everyone the whole, happens to be at. <laughs> they've taken like the whole town uh, somehow. It just seemed a little too easy for me, and maybe that's the a nature little. of a three hundred and thirty-four page book where you can't really, or three hundred and fifty-five page book, you can't really dwell on that side. You just have to take it and be like, and then there was rebellion. It happened. Let's deal with the aftermath because that happens like right in the middle of the book. I, I was looking at it mm. today. It's like right at hour four or so it's in the fourth hour of this eight hour book and i was like there's like the rebellion just happened we're only halfway through like to me it like on my third read i was like man that seems really early it also seems really easy (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean even at one point kestrel hears her father's plans to take the entire army and go follow this advice of whatever's happening outside of town and she's like are are you sure you want to do that like you want to leave the city entirely unguarded like no one is going to be here to protect the city and he's like yeah that sounds right right so this great general is just yeah okay you know let's take the entire army out of the city it just doesn't seem 
feasible and like luke said you know it, it's way too easy even the execution of the overthrow at this party where you know all of the slaves keep happening to be in the kitchen and they're all you know everyone's constantly saying well where are all the slaves like where did your slave go i don't know where did your slave go oh they're they're all in the kitchen like don't worry about the slaves in the kitchen they they're just helping with the food they can't possibly up be up to no good they're all together yeah <laughs> yeah it's just literally a it's literally a perfect storm of hey this one captain of the guard that everyone really respects dies and then everyone's put specifically in place to make it just it's a little bit of convenient writing i don't know if this is uh the first book by marie rakowski but it feels like an a a young writer thing to do in a way yeah there's definitely a bit of well here there's absolutely some convenience but even in other places in the story there's things that just happen to go exactly how they need to that you might or might not have yeah which doesn't make it a bad thing it's just those aren't the things that the story is about right those are just the plot points that happen Mm -hmm. this is that's not the main focus of of the author which you know, it, it can be fine. Um, I don't think it detracts too much. Just when you're nitpicking on like we're doing here, uh, it's a little quick. So from a quick glance, this looks like this might be her first young adult. It looks like she maybe had a couple middle grade novels that came out in like 2008-ish. Okay, and I can buy that too. This could be a graduating into a little bit higher and some of that is maybe what we're seeing. Like something like that would happen with lower stakes in a mid-grade book. No problem. Like, yeah, you're not going to dwell on that. Like (laughs) here, it's just like that extra little step, I think could have made it spend 20 more pages setting that up a little bit. Give us a little more rising action. Yeah. Yeah. Or have like one thing go wrong with it and then like (laughs) have to improvise something. It was just kind of like, oh, and and then it happened. (laughs) Mic drop. (laughs) Right. But after that all happens, we have then this kind of falling out between Kestrel and Auron, right? She's like, oh, a slave and your people rebelled and you were new about the whole time right that that kind of goes on for a little while and i'm like it I, that's not what i'm here for but yeah and it's almost like the roles get reversed after this rebellion and Aaron brings kestrel into his home not as a slave specifically but like the rebellion paper. leader cheat yeah the rebellion leader is fully here to put Kestrel in her place and he makes her wash his feet and he just treats her like absolute garbage kind of shoving in her face how his people were treated after they were taken over but that wasn't Aaron's intention what he wanted to do when he brought Kestrel into his home he you know at this point we can tell that he cares about her and he doesn't want to do any harm to her and so he thinks that by bringing her into his home he can help protect her from some of the fallout of this rebellion yeah for sure definitely i have a studio rat (laughs) that's why i've had to run out of the room a couple times gotta love those studio rats studio rats so we get to this point where Basically, finally, Kestrel makes a run for it successfully to get out of this pseudo slavery imprisonment thing that she's still like, oh, I can't trust Aaron for anything, even though he's done like the best possible thing of treating her like she treated him as a normal human for the most part and just kind of basically has put the yoke of my prisoner like i claim this to protect her 
and mm-hmm. she just doesn't want to hear it at all and that's all to me very frustrating and because it... isn't that almost what she did with Aaron? I mean, it's not that she specifically went out to buy him to protect him, but once she buys him and she's like, well, shit, what am I going to do with this slave I bought? Like, okay, come, come be, live at my house and I guess do something productive while you're here. So it, it just makes no sense why she gets so incensed about everything that goes on after this rebellion when it's kind of exactly what she did to Aaron he's just doing the best that he can to protect her given the circumstances of what is going on and he doesn't treat her poorly in fact when um the rebellion leader cheat manages to find his way into kestrel's rooms and kestrel confronts Aaron and says how dare you give him keys to my rooms Aaron says oh, no he just must have had a set of keys from when he had access to this house. I didn't specifically give it to him, but look, here is my key. I'm giving it to you. You are the only person that has a key to your room now. And, and let's be honest, like, he walks into the room figuring out that Cheat had gone in there and was literally in the process of trying to rape her. That was about to happen as much as mm-hmm. Cheat was going to be able to. And Aaron walks in and cuts this guy down. Like, in front of her. Sword. Quite literally. <laughs> sword. Through the guy. And then Kestrel has to go on and be like, oh, you gave him the key to Why would I give him the key to your room and then come in and kill him? Like, what? <laughs> Think about Get anything. Here, oh, <laughs> yeah, no, she just... She doesn't think. And I, I, I get why she's concerned the entire way she's lived her life thus far nothing's been like this and so for her to have to not be in charge now and not know what's coming it's a big change and i understand why she doesn't agree with it at first but she's entirely unreasonable yes so she finally makes a run for it right and guess what Aaron kind of catches her or at least catches up to her and sees her and I don't know if you got the feeling of this. This is what you were alluding to earlier about your poisoned necklace and uh, a note that I have here. But there's a bit of a Jamie Brienne moment uh, when they're when Brienne leaves River Run after Jamie takes over River Run. River Run in Game of Thrones, the TV show. If you didn't know what I was talking about, and there's the, a bit of a I could go catch you, but I'm gonna let you go because I care about you and because I know it's the right thing to do for you and for the situation as a whole. And like, no matter where I fall in this, letting you go is the right thing to do. So there's a bit of, there's a moment that's very similar to that. Um, And Mm -hmm. that's just what I was thinking when, when that happens, it's kind of like, Oh, the hunter sees the rabbit. The rabbit sees the hunter. The hunter doesn't pull the trigger. The rabbit gets away, kind of thing, right? It's, we're hunting rabbits. We're, we're hunt, it's rabbit season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's almost like, despite how Aaron might or might not feel about Kestrel, at this point, he is letting her go because he knows that's what's best for her. And even if he never gets to see her again, he is pretty positive in his mind that she will thank him or appreciate him for what he did yeah i hope so (laughs) i mean (laughs) the the way she's been i don't know what what's the right word for this um she's been really ignorant to what he has done for her um and Mm -hmm. i don't know i i think by the end of it they get to a certain level Um, and I think we can probably get to that now. So she escapes and basically gets to another town where the emperor actually lives. Is that right? Uh And she meets the emperor for the first time who just kind of is like, Hey, I know all about you. I basically read your book today. It's like, he knows everything (laughs) about her. And they, they get to this point where he's like, 
she she brings up the idea of hey have you ever heard of the winner's curse um yeah having you know is the cost of keeping these people slaves really worth it in the long run when if we just basically stop being the persians and start being the romans here is a bit of how it is uh Mm -hmm. they'll be happier governing themselves as our subjugates like instead of slaves let them be a part of us and we'll just go from there and he's like that's treason get out of here but she's like no 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 <laughs> like just think about it and he's like oh wait that's a good idea you should marry my son <laughs> or i'm not going to do this it's yeah the, the very end is all strange to to put it lightly <laughs> i think what you know, kestrel definitely doesn't expect either of those reactions i think when she goes to the emperor with her proposition yeah it's it's about it's even quicker than the rebellion right hey (laughs) i'm gonna go because it it comes down to another ultimatum right i'm going to go and obliterate everyone that's rebelling in this town i'm just gonna go and take the army we're gonna kill them all right we're gonna get Ares targaryen daenerys targaryen all over <laughs> them and she's like that's a bad idea i don't like this idea he's like or i like your idea really but we need an alliance between the military aka her father and the emperor him so he's like marry my son and i'll basically make what you're talking about happen of allowing them to rule their own land but pay us taxes and basically we get only the good without the hassle which should be the way to start i think but i feel like the emperor's two polar opposite reactions kind of really set up the conflicts that are going to happen later gotcha okay in the next book yes and i will leave that at that no that, that's fine i mean it's clearly a big implication um huge cliffhanger of we, we know which way she chooses she chooses to marry his son at least to be engaged to his son at this point and then she goes basically to Arin, who has been kind of put in charge of controlling this town now because after he killed basically now the leader of the finished rebellion town (laughs) Uh, so yeah Arin is basically the the leader of this new town of harani that they've overtaken their old stomping grounds and kestrel is put in charge well she puts herself in charge basically she tells no, let me message. It'll come better coming from me. Right. Yeah. She. It's gonna be easier to talk to this guy uh, because he's like totally in love with me, and it's just gonna be easier. <laughs> She's not thinking that, but it, it's definitely they have more. And of like a maybe I just want to go see his face one more time because yeah. I really, really have feelings for him, and I kind of only just realized it. Yeah. No, that's that's also a big part of it for sure (laughs) and he (laughs) originally is like hey that deal is way too good of a deal um what is the you know what's the trick here right and she's like uh the emperor is offering you a pretty good deal you're probably better off not questioning it and just going with it because we all know what the other side of this coin is gonna be and there's no doubt that if General Trajan came in, the whole city would be wiped out. There's just no mm-hmm. no chance of that not happening. There's not enough manpower with the remaining Haranis. The army is pretty well provisioned and stocked up. Like that's it's gonna be awful. So she's like, hey, take the best deal you can, like I did, as I'm standing here covered in jewels as the betrothed to the heir to the empire like hey i had to make my decision i'm telling you 
you should probably make the right decision. And there's a lot of emotional turmoil back and forth because they both realize like that love that they both have for each other can't happen, right? It, it's it's just something that isn't going to be in the cards for the long run. And he makes a stipulation to this deal. And he says, well, I'll agree to the deal if you are the one that acts as the go-between, you know, kind of the liaison uh, between the emperor and our town. Only you, because I know how to speak to you. I actually understand you. And also, and I've got I know the total when you're lying. You. Yeah, and I know <laughs> when you're lying. <laughs> and I've got the hots for you. I, I think that's definitely number one. The rest of them are just like bonuses. <laughs> yeah, bonus somethings. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay that's pretty much the end of the book i guess yeah uh, basically it ends it ends there (laughs) so what is one thing that you absolutely hated about this book i'm not i'm not a romance guy i this definitely (laughs) was there but even with that it was just annoying i think it was like that trying to be unrequited unallowable love almost like a capulet and montague or hatfield and mccoy like oh this is forbidden and i just don't think it <laughs> was built up enough for me to really believe it because the whole time like the entire time it was obvious that this was going to happen from the day that she sees this guy is like I don't know why you yeah, caught my on. attention. It's probably it's because he's hot. Like God damn. Like just he's hot. Get over it. Yeah, it's almost like neither of them ever like have any kind of romantic feelings and then all of a sudden they just like spring up out of nowhere. Like you can tell they're coming. But there's yeah. never any indication on either party as to what they're feeling and <laughs> I think there's indication. I think they're both just totally ignorant. Like in the truest sense of the word, like it, because they, they, they're supposed to be right. But I don't think it's done that well. I, and I, it, I just found it kind of annoying if that makes sense. Like, I, mm-hmm. like just do it or don't shit or get off the pot. Come on. That's, that's where I was with, with that side of it. I guess that'd be my, my biggest hate. Fair enough. You? The rebellion, like the way that everything just lined up so perfectly. I don't know. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more conflict go on or like one thing go wrong that might ruin the entire rebellion. And then someone figures out a solution that makes it work. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's totally fair as well. (laughs) Oh, uh, your one love. You're only allowed one. I know there's so many to choose from in this book. <laughs> I liked that it was short. No. Um <laughs> It it's, it's overall it's a pretty good book. Um the one thing I enjoyed most, I, I liked just like I started off with the carnival row like and I don't know where it came from that I had that thematic style in my head, but it's mostly from the beginning of the book. I just, I can visualize a lot of this, at least the early stuff, as a mini series. At least, you know, you could make six pretty good episodes out of a television show for this. You know, it stars. If you're listening, this would be a decent one, because um, <laughs> it's it's relatively straightforward. There's a couple twists here and there. There's some drama, but just the overall feel of it i think is a really general answer but that that's kind of the thing i enjoyed most about it i liked the at least the little bit of history that we got to set up the tone for where we were going i think that Mm -hmm. was done well and i I think that kind of carries a lot of us plus plus the glass of wine is like a holding holding a jewel line i just i love that line you know (laughs) me luke the socialite yeah, that's such a diva. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Luke Raya Carey. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's me. <laughs> totally. Watch out for my sex tape. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> uh, okay, so if I had to pick like the one thing that I love the most about this book, I think it's the parallels between the world of this book and our real world. It almost felt like it was deeply inspired by like American history and uh, just the, the way that, you know, we kind of overtook people and we... I said, nope, this is our land now, and we're doing what we want. I don't know. It felt very historical in a fantasy world. I would agree with that, for sure. And I, I made references to, like, Spartacus earlier. There are a lot of um, mm -hmm. old, ancient, historical-type things that are thematically represented here, too. I, it's basically, like I said... It, Stop being the Persians as they're portrayed in the movie 300 or so of, hey, take over, make them all slaves or be the Romans and take them over and let them do their own thing. That's kind of the, the overall. The really, the really unfortunate part of this is it shows you how many parallels there are between ancient civilizations and how often it really happens. Like when you think about, oh, this is like the Persians and this is like the americans and like oh, so other many it, it, it's no it's nothing new it, it's no. nothing new history really does repeat itself and i think you would enjoy the wheel of time series it's only 28 books or so um it's it's like one of the biggest <laughs> fantasy yeah, stories only 28 books i think it's like 20 i think it's 23 but i've only read the first i one. mean i could read that in a year <laughs> yeah. we'll just next year we'll just do wheel of time that would it's entirely the entire season <laughs> it would be it'd be a lot they're big each one yeah. is big okay so final thoughts and would you recommend this book hmm overall good if if, if you like i would say this is definitely a young adult book um in in a in terms of the romance level it, it feels very naive and inexperienced in those emotions and if you're looking for that that's that's fine you know I, to me it, there can be some romance right i'm not saying hey everyone it has to be lord of the rings where there's basically two <laughs> females in the story that's not what i'm saying although those are awesome books it just doesn't feel real to me because of how dumb they are in their own way about it if that makes sense like i'm not trying to be harsh about it it just yeah. it doesn't hit that main point and that to me is one of the biggest points of the book it's one of the major core themes that i think isn't done very well and like we did throne of glass and we've both read um akatar a court of thorn and roses and I feel like it's done a lot better in those, even if it's not to my taste. I feel like it's done better in those, if that makes sense. But overall, I would I would definitely recommend this book. Um, give it a shot. It's it's a quick read, which, like I said, it, it is nice. Um, it doesn't take you very very long. You can do this in a day or two if if you're an avid reader. A week if you're more casual, pretty easily, I'd say. Uh, on your commutes, which no one's going anywhere right now. So uh, while you're walking to your desk in the living room. Well, at that rate, it's going to take me like three months to finish this thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, I would I would recommend it, but I, I wouldn't look at it too critically. Yeah, I, I that's a fair assessment, I think. I, obviously, I would recommend it because it was my choice for this month. <laughs> Um, I really do love this book, and I think more so for the characters than the romance or the complexity of the plot. I just, I appreciate that at the time I read this, Kestrel was so different than any other young adult heroine I'd ever read, and I appreciate that about her, and I think the story does mature over time through the series itself 
Yes. Okay. I and really like I mentioned earlier, I think this could t- be turned into a like the bones of this story are good. Like they're they're done well. The story itself, there's there are things there that can be used for sure. Netflix, if you're listening, this should be a candidate. I will write for this for you. Six six <laughs> episode mini series could be done really really well with this portion of the story. I ha- I haven't read anything else in the series, but it sounds like that would likely be able to turn into multiple seasons of a, a, a series or so. So I, the bones of the story are good. So I'm, I'm in. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this wraps up episode three of the podcast that gets lit. Make sure you check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram is up and rolling as it of today. Rolling. It is going <laughs> And you can find us at Gets Lit Podcast. Make sure you subscribe here on YouTube um, at Drawbridge Media. Yeah, subscribe here, he says. <laughs> Hitting the like button helps us out a lot. And please make sure to check out the links in the description below this video to find other ways of supporting our channel, buying this book, and much, much more. Yeah, definitely check out the links in the in the description below. There's a lot of fun stuff in there, uh, including links to buy this book, audiobook, and all that stuff. Uh, other ways you can help support our show uh, or every show on this channel, this show and all of our shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. You can learn more about our awesome Imaginary Legion member benefits at patreon.com slash stay imaginary we really do hope you'll join us next time when the great traction city of london has been skulking in the hills to avoid the bigger faster hungrier cities loose in the great hunting ground but now the sinister plans of lord mayor magnus chrome can finally unfold when we talk about mortal engines by philip reeve And until next time, just keep reading. And until next time, stay imaginary. 